Hey, welcome to First Church Live. We are so glad that you are joining us today. My name is Chad, and we're excited that you're worshiping with us wherever you are, whether it's in Owasso or somewhere beyond. We know we have hundreds of different homes joining us at this time for worship, and we're just glad that you're here. And if you were with us last week, you know that we launched a new teaching series, a new sermon series, which we are calling Curveball. And we chose this topic, this theme, for a couple different reasons. One, because it's supposed to be baseball season right now. And I've mentioned before in past messages, I'm really missing sports. I'm missing sports so much that my wife even bought me this shirt the other day that just says, I miss sports. She ordered this for me and I've been wearing it. So if you guys have seen it online, you're like, man, I want that shirt too because you're with me. You understand this. I am. I'm missing sports a lot. And right now, by this point, my family would have already attended a couple different Tulsa Drillers baseball games. We would have been there and had a good time as a family. And my kids, they love attending baseball games. So we're not the biggest baseball followers in the world, but we still love going to games. And my kids love the atmosphere. They love the food, and they love the giveaways, and they love the sport itself. They love being able to go to Tulsa Drillers games and play out in the lawn area and the play area that they have there. But one of their favorite parts about attending a Drillers game is being able to sing during the seventh inning stretch because they love being able to belt out loud, take me out to the ball game. And if you've ever been to a professional baseball game, you know that during the seventh inning stretch, that song is often sung. And so since I'm missing baseball right now, missing sports, I thought it might be good for some of our kids to sing for us, take me out to the ball game. And so we asked them to do just that. Take a look at this video. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never get back. Because it's rude. Root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Well, it's one, two, three, four, five. Tap it out the old ball game. You guys may not know this, but when baseball does come back, they're adding the number of strikes that you get, okay? According to that kid, you've heard it here first, all right? Just want to let you know. Now, honestly, we want to hear your family singing, take me out to the ball game. So if you would, film your family sometime today on your phone, iPad, computer, whatever, filming that, I mean, singing that song, and then post it online with the tag at First Church, okay? And we would love to see your family singing that song. We would love for you to share it with us because we're all missing baseball right now, at least I am. But we didn't just choose this series because it's supposed to be baseball season. We also chose the theme curveball because let's face it, our culture has been thrown a definite curveball because of this whole COVID-19 situation. Now, if you've played baseball before, you know what a curveball is. A curveball is actually, if we can go on to the next slide there, a pitch that is thrown with spin so that the ball makes an unexpected curve before it crosses home plate. And if you've ever played the game, you've probably had that embarrassing or awkward experience of diving out of the batter's box, thinking one thing, only to hear the umpire call strike, knowing that you've been fooled by a curveball. And here's the thing, curveballs don't just happen in baseball. They also happen in life. We all know this to be true. Life is full of unexpected twists and turns that often catch us off guard. And that's why in this series, we're looking at different people in the Bible who are thrown some curveball at some point in their lives, maybe multiple different curveballs, and we're looking at how they responded and how God continued to work in their lives. Because we know curveballs are going to happen. But here's the thing. Curveballs do happen, and we know that they happen, but sometimes those twists and turns that we experience, they're exactly what we need. And I think we forget that sometimes. See, sometimes twists and turns happen, and they just happen, but sometimes they're needed. 
especially when our lives are going in a direction that they're not supposed to be going, especially when we need to be shook up or woke up in some way, especially when we need to be tested. Because here's a difficult truth that it's taken me a while to learn, but I have learned it over my years, and it's this. Faith that can't be tested isn't real faith. How do you know if your faith is real if it's never tested? Faith that can't be tested isn't real faith. And God knows that if we are going to live the lives that he's calling us to live, if our faith is going to be as strong as it needs to be, we need some testing. We need some twists and turns to make sure we are where we're supposed to be. Let me illustrate it like this. When I was in college, I had the chance to audit a class. There was this class that I wanted to take because I really thought the information would be good, but I didn't need the class in order to graduate. So I talked to the professor to see if it would be okay if I would just audit the class, meaning I could sit through the class lectures and the time together, but I wouldn't have to do any of the assignments or the papers or the tests. And I thought, this is going to be great. I can sit here and absorb all this information and not have to take any tests, not have to write any papers, not have to do any assignments. This is going to be great. And you know what? My interest in that class lasted for about two weeks. (laughs) Because after two, maybe three weeks, I just wasn't interested anymore. You know why? Because there was no one holding me accountable. So I continued to show up for class, but then I started to daydream and not pay attention. Over time, I just stopped showing up for class. I stopped being interested because there's no one holding me accountable anymore. And that's the thing about life. If our faith is never tested, how do we know that it's real? God knows that in order for our faith to grow, and in order for us to become the people that we need to be, testing isn't just important. It's essential. Now, let me clarify something real fast. Before we go any further, God never does anything to harm us or tempt us but he will allow us to be tested. God never does anything to harm us or to tempt us, but he will allow for us to be tested. And sometimes we're tested just because of the life, ex- the life circumstances that we experience. But sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, it's God who actually does the testing. And that was a situation for a guy that we read about in the book of Genesis named Abraham. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app on your phone or tablet, we're going to be looking at the life of Abraham today, and we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 12. Now, out of all the people in Jewish history, Abraham was one of the heroes of the faith. If you were an ancient Jew, you respected Abraham. You wanted to be like Abraham. Like I said, he was a hero of the faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we find what's called the Faith Hall of Fame. It's a list of all these great guys who lived during the Old Testament time who had this great faith. And so there are names listed there like Noah and Moses and Elijah and David and Gideon, all those great names that we've heard about in Sunday school for years. But out of all the people who are listed in this Faith Hall of Fame, no one gets more airtime, no one gets more square footage than Abraham. Abraham was a hero of the Jews. They wanted to be like him. In fact, there were 12 chapters in the book of Genesis dedicated just to the life of Abraham. And what's interesting is Abraham gets this unique distinction. Look at what James says about him in James 2 verse 23. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Not just a friend of God, but he was called the friend of God. Can you imagine having that distinction all of your life? For that matter, having that label attached to you for all of eternity? How cool would that be? Now, all of us want to be a friend of God, and God wants to have this friendship, this intimate relationship with us, but it's as if Abraham is our model. He's our example for how to do this. He was called the friend of God. Of God. And as we read his story, as we read about his life in Genesis, we discover why Abraham was called God's friend. So after the fall of Adam and Eve, when Adam and Eve chose to sin and they were kicked out of the garden, after Noah and the flood, after the Tower of Babel came crashing down, that's basically the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we're introduced in Genesis chapter 12 to this young man named Abraham and his wife Sarah. And God appears to Abraham and Sarah, and listen to what God says to them in Genesis 12, verse 1. 
God says to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. What a statement. There's not a promise, there's not a statement made like that anywhere else in Scripture. Can you imagine having God tell you, I've got a plan for you, and if you live out this plan, all peoples will be blessed through you. All nations will be blessed through you. How cool would it have been to have been on the receiving end of that promise? And so God says, if you want for that to come true, if you want that to happen, here's what you need to do. Leave everything you know. Leave your hometown, leave your people, leave your family, leave your job, leave everything behind that you're familiar with and go to the place that I'm going to show you. Now, what you need to understand is Abraham and Sarah, they were from this town called Ur, just you are Ur. Can you imagine that being the name of your hometown? Hey, where are you from, Ur? I mean, that's comical, isn't it? I'm from Ur. In fact, I said in my office this week and just kind of said that over and over again, Ur, Ur, Ur. And I thought, what a, what a town name. And then I remembered, you know, I've heard about some interesting comical town names before as well that are in our country, especially some from my home state, Kentucky. Believe it or not, there is an Oddville, Kentucky. This is a real place. It's about 20 minutes from where I used to preach. I've been there. Can you imagine somebody asking, where are you from? I'm from Oddville. I'm from Oddville, Kentucky. I mean, what? How would you, how would you react to that? I mean, that's hilarious. And if you've ever been to Oddville like I am, well, you'll learn pretty quick why it's called that. But that's not the worst one. There is also a Possum Trot, Kentucky. Not only did they misspell the word possum, but it's possum trot and yes this is a real place in fact if you look at this next picture this right here is the possum trot quick mart you can go there and take a picture at the possum trot quick mart it's a real place I don't know who came up with that name but they did but there's one even worse than that there is also a booger branch Kentucky my six-year-old son would love to be from there he would love to say I'm from booger branch I mean he would get a kick out of that but it's not just Kentucky that has some funny town names there are funny town names all over our country. For instance, there is a Wiener, Arkansas. I don't know who the guy was that decided to name this town Wiener, but can you imagine? I go to Wiener High School. I mean, can you imagine that being your town name? What about this one right here? Ding Dong, Texas. Probably the same guy that named Wiener, Arkansas, also named Ding Dong, Texas. But then there's one more here, Big Bottom, Washington. I'm the mayor of Big Bottom. Can you imagine saying that? I mean, these are just crazy names, but these are real communities. These are real places. And now, here in Oklahoma, we have our share of funny town names as well. But I found one the other day that I actually kind of liked. There is a Cookie Town, Oklahoma. There's a community in our state called Cookie Town, Oklahoma. You know what? I wouldn't mind being from there. How cool would that be to say, I'm from Cookie Town? That's an appealing name. That's an attractive name. Big Bottom and Booger Branch and Wiener, not so much. But Cookie Town, I can take. Ur, where Abraham and Sarah was from, not so much. It doesn't sound like a very appealing or attractive name, but don't let the name fool you. See, Ur wasn't some podunk town in the middle of nowhere. Ur was the apex of civilization during Abraham and Sarah's time. Ur was a cosmopolitan area that was on the level of like New York or London or Paris today. There were a lot of people who lived in Ur There were a lot of people who wanted to live in Ur. And here's the thing, Abraham and Sarah, they were of the elite class in Ur. They were wealthy. Abraham had a high-paying job. They could afford just about anything. They had a house to die for in the suburbs. They drove the nicest vehicles. They were part of a great social class of friends. And what they didn't have, they could afford if they wanted it. Sarah was able to shop at the nicest stores in Ur. But not only that, Ur was home. Ur was where they were from. Ur was where their family was from. And some of you guys know what it's like to leave home. I remember several months ago, I preached a sermon, and in that sermon, I asked you guys, and we were still meeting in this 
big room here. I asked you guys, if you're not from Owasso, raise your hand. And like half the hands went up. Owasso is a transient community. I know many of you, though, you now call Owasso home. It hasn't always been home. And it was probably difficult for you to leave where you were from. And I know what that's like. I remember when I first decided to move here. I never stepped foot in the state of Oklahoma until I came and interviewed for the job here. And if you were to have asked me five years ago, Chad, would you ever live in Oklahoma? I probably would have said, why would I live in Oklahoma? Not because I thought it was a bad thing. I just, that wasn't even on my radar. I wasn't even thinking about moving to Oklahoma. And leaving home, leaving my home state, was born and raised, that was tough. It's tough to leave home. It's tough to leave everything you're familiar with. And yet, that's exactly what Abraham and Sarah do God says, I want you to leave your home, your friends, your family, your people, everything that you know, and go where I'm asking you to go. And Abraham and Sarah say, okay. Now, why would they do this? There are probably a lot of reasons, but one reason I think we shouldn't overlook is that in that house to die for that was in the suburbs, down from Abraham and Sarah's master suite, down the hallway from their master suite, there was a nursery A nursery that was fully decorated, fully stocked, but never occupied. See, Abraham and Sarah, like most young couples, had the dream of starting a family. And they waited and waited. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, months turned into years, and yet that nursery was never occupied. I can't imagine how many trips Abraham and Sarah made to the local CVS pharmacy to get a home pregnancy test. And yet that little blue plus sign never appeared. But even though that little blue plus sign never appeared, God appeared. And God came to them when they were up in years and said, I want to make a promise to you. A promise that is bigger than anything you could ever come up with on your own. All you have to do is trust me. And so Abraham and Sarah say, okay, we'll do it. Now, I can just imagine how the next part of this conversation went. (laughs) I mean, Abraham says, okay, God, we'll go with you. Where is it that we're going? And Abraham pulls out his smartphone, and he looks up his little maps app and says, okay, what's the address, God? Where are we headed? Where are we going? And God says, Abraham, let's not worry about the where right now. Let's just worry about the who. It's you and me, Abraham. It's us. And from what you know about me, can you trust me? Can you just trust me right now? To where I don't have to give you all the details. You're just going to go where I'm asking you to go because you trust me. And honestly, I think this is the question that God is asking all of us because more than anything else, what God wants is for us to know we can trust him. You know why? Because trust is the basis of love. Trust is the basis of any healthy relationship. And more than anything else, God wants to know, God wants us to know that we can trust him. And yes, God wants us to like him, and yes, God wants us to honor him, and God wants us to revere him and respect him, but more than anything else, God wants us to trust him because trust is the basis of love. It's the basis of any healthy relationship. It is the foundation of faith. God wants us to know that no matter what, we can trust him, that no matter what, What he promises, he will always provide. What God promises, he will always provide. And so, God asks Abraham, do you trust me? And Abraham says, I do, God. Let's go. So Abraham turns in his two weeks notice. He calls in the movers. They pack up all their stuff. They say goodbye to their friends and family, and they head to an unknown location where God is directing them. Now, here's the thing. God has promised them a child, and through this child, a great nation would be born, and all peoples would be blessed, and we understand that through the descendants of this child that God has promised Abraham and Sarah that the Messiah, Jesus, would eventually come. So God makes them this promise. Now, Abraham and Sarah, they're 
75 and 65. He's 75, she's 65 at this time. They're getting up in years. And so you would think this child would come pretty soon, but he doesn't. Years pass, decades pass, and still, Sarah's not pregnant. And over the next several years, as Abraham and Sarah follow God, their life is a roller coaster ride. I mean, in Genesis chapter 12, by the end of Genesis chapter 12, we see that a famine affects them, and they have to go to Egypt in order to find food. And while they're there, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, tries to steal Sarah, Abraham's wife, away from him. But God intervenes, and the threat is neutralized. We move on to Genesis chapter 13, and by that point, Abraham's nephew, a guy named Lot, tries to position himself to be Abraham's heir, and God again steps in and he says, no, 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 your nephew Lot is not going to be your heir. I'm going to provide you a son. By chapter 15, what we find out is that, well, Abraham starts to get a little bit discouraged, and he puts together a will, and he still doesn't have a son. And so he says, okay, I'm going to make one of my servants my heir. And so he appoints this man named Eleazar, who was his servant, to be the heir of his estate and his family. And God again speaks to Abraham and says, no, 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 Eleazar isn't going to be your heir. I'm going to give you a son. By chapter 16, Sarah gets frustrated waiting. And so Sarah comes up with her own plan. And one night she goes to Abraham and she says, Hey, Abraham, maybe God needs our help just a little bit. This is what we're going to do. I want you to sleep with my maidservant. That's always a good idea. I want you to sleep with my maidservant, get her pregnant, and then we will adopt her child as our own. We're going to help God out here just a little bit. And Abraham, the big dummy, does what Sarah says. And it just leads to problem after problem after problem problem, but Sarah's maidservant does get pregnant and has a son named Ishmael. And for years, Abraham thinks just maybe Ishmael could be his long-awaited heir, long-awaited heir. And yet, 13 years later, God appears to Abraham in chapter 17 and says, no, your heir is going to come from your wife, Sarah. You're going to have a child with her. And by this point, Abraham is almost 100 years old and his wife Sarah is 90 years old. And the Bible says that when God says this to them, he laughs out loud. In fact, in Genesis 17, it says, Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man 100 years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? We find out in Genesis 17 that Sarah was actually listening close by and she hears God say this and she laughs out loud as well. There's no way and we can understand why they would laugh at this. I mean, he's 100 years old and she's 90. They're going to be the only couple shopping at Walmart for both Huggies and Depends at the same time. I mean, we understand why they laughed out loud. But what seems impossible is always possible with God. And God wants them to know, what I've promised, I always provide. And that's exactly what happens. Abraham and Sarah, they have a child. Sarah gets pregnant. She gives birth to a son. And they name him Isaac. And I love the name Isaac because it just means laughter. It's it's as if they're reminding themselves, even though we laughed at God's promise, God still provided. And this gives me some hope, honestly, because this lets me know that as we walk with God, God leaves room for some doubt on our part. He really does. He knows that when we first take a step of faith that we're starting a journey with him. When we take that first step of faith, we may not be where we need to be in our relationship with him, but we'll get there eventually, step after step after step. We'll get there eventually. So God allows for a little bit of our doubting, a little bit of our questions, a little bit of our laughter at times. He allows for that because he knows that if we follow him long enough, if we walk with him long enough, eventually we'll trust him. God knows the longer we walk with him, the more we'll trust him. So he puts up with a little bit of our laughter, a little bit of our questions, a little bit of our doubt. Because he knows if we just keep walking with him, we'll get there. And that's what happens here. Isaac is born. And Abraham gets to see firsthand that what God promises, he provides. And so Abraham gets to raise his son. 
And this would be a perfect place to end our story. I mean, Isaac is born. Finally, Abraham and Sarah have the son that they've waited for for decades, for years. How exciting is this? Probably Abraham and Sarah were never happier. So tie a bow. I mean, drop the curtain. Roll the credits. The story should end right here. Abraham's passing out cigars in the waiting room to all of his buddies. But this isn't where the story ends. In fact, the journey that God wants Abraham to take with him, there's still a lot more to it. And here's why. Because it's one thing to believe in God. It's a whole other thing to believe God. Let me explain what I mean by that. It's one thing to believe in God and the existence of God, that God is there and that he's real. But it's a whole other thing to believe God, meaning to trust him completely to trust him with your life, to trust him with what's most valuable and important to you, to trust him all the way. It's one thing to believe in God. A lot of people in our culture today, they believe in the existence of God. They believe God is real, but not near as many people actually believe God in the sense that they trust him with their entire lives. And right now during this whole COVID-19 situation, there are a lot of people who are acknowledging the, the existence of God that haven't been really acknowledging him in the past, and that's great, and that's awesome, but God wants us to get to the point where we're not just acknowledging his existence and believing that he's real, but that we're actually believing him to the point that we're willing to give everything to him. Remember what I said, what God wants more than anything else is for us to trust him. So Abraham raises Isaac, his boy. And like I said, I bet you Abraham has never been happier. He gets, he gets to teach his boy how to ride a bike and throw a ball. He gets to take him hunting and fishing. He gets to teach him how to skip rocks. And he probably has to have that unfortunate birds and bees conversation with him. I'm not looking forward to that conversation with my son. I know it's coming one day, but I'm not looking forward to it. But still, it's just part of being a dad. Abraham gets to raise Isaac. And like I said, Abraham... He's probably never been happier. And Isaac, he's growing up to be a young man. And as Isaac grows up, God appears to Abraham again. And listen to what God says this time. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Remember what I said. Sometimes we're tested just because life circumstances happen. But sometimes it's God that does the testing. And that's what's going on here. And God said to him, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Now, this isn't a game of hide and seek here. God knows exactly where Abraham is, and Abraham knows that God knows where he is. But that phrase in Hebrew, here I am, actually means I'm available, God. I'm here for whatever you want. Abraham knows that God is getting ready to ask something of him. And Abraham says, whatever you want, God, I'm here. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Can I be the first to say, huh? What? I mean, think back on the timeline here. Abram and Sarah want a child. They wait for years. They, they're not able to get pregnant. God appears to them, and God says, I'm going to give you a child. They have to wait even more years. But eventually, after decades of a roller coaster ride, eventually a son comes, and Abraham and Sarah get to raise their boy, Isaac. And Isaac is growing up to be a young man, and it looks like that everything is going great. And all of a sudden, God appears to Abraham and says... I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac on an altar like you would sacrifice an animal to me. Huh? I have to admit, for years I really struggled with Genesis chapter 22. It still makes me feel really uncomfortable. And I understand that in our New Testament age, in this age of Christ, that 
He is our ultimate sacrifice, and God will never ask me to physically sacrifice one of my children, nor will he ask you. I get that. That was a different day and age, a different time, and honestly, God ends up not allowing Abraham to sacrifice his son. Spoiler alert, God provides another way, and we'll talk about that here in just a second, but still, the fact that God even asked Abraham to do this, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. But as puzzling as God's request is, What's even more puzzling is Abraham's response. God says, I want you to take your son Isaac to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And you know what the very next verse says? It says, early the next morning, the very next day, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Abraham's actually going to go through with it. Why? How? It's because after all this time of walking with God, Abraham had finally gotten to the point where he didn't just believe in the existence of God, he believed God. He had finally got to the point in his life that he trusted God with everything. He had finally got to the point where he believed when God makes a promise, he always provides. And that's why Abraham does what he does next. Verse 4, it says, on the third day. Now that's symbolic. What else happened in three days? On the third day, Abraham looked up And saw the place in the distance, the place where God told him to sacrifice Isaac. And he said to his servants, remember he brought two of them with him, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. See, I believe one of the most important words in this entire passage is this word we right here. Abraham knows exactly what God is asking him to do. God is asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac on an altar. And yet, what does Abraham say to his servants? He says, you guys stay over here. I'm going to take the boy with me. We're going to go worship and do what God said. But then we, meaning me and the boy, me and Isaac, we will come back to you. Abraham believed that Isaac would live after this experience. He probably wasn't exactly sure how, but he knew that Isaac would live again. You know why? Because God had already made Abraham a promise. God had already promised Abraham that through Isaac's descendants, through Isaac's offspring, a great nation would be born and all peoples would be blessed. And we know the rest of the story that out of that nation, the Messiah, Jesus, would come. God had already made the promise to Abraham that Isaac was going to have children. And you know what? Isaac hasn't had any kids yet. Isaac isn't even married yet. And Abraham believes God to the point that he knows that Isaac will have to live again because Isaac will have offspring. Abraham knows what God has promised he will provide. And so the book of Hebrews chapter 11 gives a little insight into what Abraham was thinking. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, there it is again, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Now pause right there for a second. I've already let you know, Abraham actually doesn't have to go through with offering Isaac a sacrifice. So why does the passage say in the New Testament that Abraham offered Isaac? Isaac as a sacrifice because Abraham had already made up his mind to do it. In the heart of Abraham, in the mind of Abraham, he had already sacrificed Isaac. He was going to go through with this and God knew it. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned and Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead and figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Did you catch that phrase? Abraham reasoned that God could bring somebody back from the dead. Here's the thing. God had never done that up until this point in history. Yes, later on in both the Old and New Testament times, God will bring people back from the dead, but God hasn't done that yet. Abraham's never seen God bring somebody back from the dead. He's never even heard of God bringing somebody back from the dead. 
So why does Abraham think that God can bring his son back? Because Abraham knows the God that he's following. And he knows that this God that he's following is the God who spoke everything into existence from nothing. This God that he's following is the God who brought life to his wife's barren womb. And if this God who can bring life from nothing, if this God who can bring life to his wife's barren womb is the God that he is following, then this God can breathe life back into his son. Abraham knows God and trusts God enough that he says, God, whatever you ask, I'll do it. The only irrational thing, the only unreasonable thing that Abraham could have done in this moment was not do what God was asking him to do. Because if God really is who Abraham believed he was, he could trust him. He knew that God would take care of him. And so, Abraham believed God and did the only irrational thing that he knew to do. Do what the God you trust is asking you to do. And so Abraham lifts the knife over the altar sacrifice. His son is tied down. I can't imagine what's going through Abraham's mind as he's looking into the eyes of his son. And he raises the knife and right as he's getting ready to sacrifice Isaac, he hears a voice from the heavens. And the voice says, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. What God promises, he always provides. And my question is, do you believe that? Do you really trust this God who you claim to follow. Because if you know your biblical geography, you know that Mount Moriah and the mountain chain associated with it actually has another name. It's also known as Mount Zion or Jerusalem. It would be on this mountain chain that God would tell his people to establish a temple where sacrifices would be offered year in and year out. And it was on this very mountain chain that another father 2,000 years after Abraham would sacrifice his only son. And he would do it on a cross and no one stopped this sacrifice. This sacrifice happened. And why would God sacrifice his one and only son on a cross who didn't deserve it, who did nothing to earn such punishment? Because from the moment that we sin, from the moment that we rebelled against God, God made a promise, I will find a way back home for them. I will restore them. I will redeem them. I will save them because I can't live without them. I don't want to live without them. And whatever God promises, he provides And I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what brokenness you're experiencing. I don't know what pain you've been put through. I don't know what sickness you may be dealing with. I don't know what temptation you may be facing. I don't know what sin has done to you or what sin you have committed. But I do know one thing. God has promised to make all things new. And one day he will restore everything everything and all sickness all pain all heartache all suffering will be gone 
And maybe we won't experience the life that we want to experience right now, but one day we will when God makes all things new. And here's what I'm letting you know. You can trust that God who has made that promise. What God has promised, He provides. And no matter what you're facing right now, you can trust God. Because one day He's going to say, enough. And you will live the life that your soul has always longed to live. Do you trust him? Because I'm betting my life today that this Jesus who I'm following is not only exactly who he claims to be, but that he can be fully and completely trusted. I've been told, I don't have much experience with this, but I've been told that the only difference between a professional gambler and an amateur gambler is that a professional gambler never puts anything on the table he can't walk away from. Never bets anything, never wagers anything that he can't walk away from. He never bets his rent money or his mortgage money or his car payment or his food money. He never bets, he never puts anything on the table that he can't walk away from. And I'm afraid that in our culture of the church today, we have settled for a brand of Christianity that's made up of professional Christians who believe in God and show up to church when we have services, (laughs) maybe even worship from home right now, but who never put anything on the table for God they can't walk away from. They never put what's most valuable to them, what's most precious to them on the table for Him. And what God wants to know today is, do you trust him with everything? And he means everything. Because, guys, I'm betting my life that this God that I'm following can be trusted. I don't want to hear any of the stuff about, hey, well, even if Christianity isn't real, then it's still been a nice way to live baloney. Christianity can be a pretty difficult way of life when you really follow God. I'm betting my life that this God whom I'm following can be trusted. What about you? Do you need to move from simply believing in God to believing Him? Because when you start to trust Him, when you start to believe Him, He will work in your life in ways like you can't imagine. Because what God has promised, He always always provides. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for today and this opportunity we've had to open up your word and study it and look at the example of Abraham. And Father, even though this is a difficult story for us to read, maybe an uncomfortable one, we know that it is in your word for a reason, for us to learn from it. And I believe what you're trying to teach us is what you promise you always provide. Father, may we trust you fully. May we go where you tell us to go, do what you tell us to do, say what you tell us to say. And in so doing, may we be called your friends. In the name of Jesus, who has sacrificed on the cross for me and for the entire world, I pray. Amen.